Good morning. Welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us as we prepare another virtual worship service for you. Uh, we do have more announcements and some information for everybody, but we will get to that after we have had a chance to prepare our minds and hearts for worship. So please enjoy the music. Again, good morning and welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. I want to welcome any of you who are joining us maybe for the first time on our YouTube or Facebook broadcast. On YouTube it is St. Stephen Today. On Facebook it is just St. Stephen Church. But you can find our worship services there. We appreciate you being here, and we hope that when we have an official reopening that some of you who've been watching may join us and decide to become a part of our congregation, and we would be excited and, and happy to have you. Um, as far as announcements go for this week, the first one, if I'm correct, is that our piano, pianist and our technical guru and, and singer are celebrating 33 years of marriage, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. We want to extend our congratulations and let you know that we're celebrating with you. And, uh, the only thing I've done consecutively for 33 years is breathe. So that's an accomplishment. Um, we don't have any birthdays listed. We do have an anniversary for Tim and Tammy Gaddis, members of the church now for 22 years, and we want to congratulate them on their anniversary with our church. Please pardon me as I keep fiddling with my glasses, but I haven't figured out a way to keep them from fogging up, and so half of the time I'm blind. Anyway, um, pardon me for, for fidgeting so much. We do want to remember some people in our prayer request, but I will cover that at prayer time. We have officially entered fall, and I guess football season. I uh, had a lot of fun yesterday. Kim and I went to our niece's wedding in the hurricane, outdoors, 
You know, every time I start thinking our young people are getting smarter and more flexible and more practical and thinking that it's not gonna be so bad to turn things over to them, I run into situations like I ran into yesterday when they're too stubborn to change their plans. So we uh, had a wedding ceremony in the rain and then we had a reception in the rain and they announced that we were under a tornado warning and nobody bothered to leave. So um, it was kind of exciting, but I do want to extend congratulations to Allison and John on their marriage. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun in spite of the weather. So we enjoyed that. Kim, that's where Kim is this morning. My wife is doing a, a brunch for the wedding party. But, um, at any rate, we will cover prayer requests when prayer time comes. And for now, please enjoy our music as we sing some hymns. Our first hymn of praise is in our Methodist hymnal, page 381. And if you uh, received a bulletin in your email, um, it's, list, it's printed in your email too. So you at home can sing along with us and you here can just hum with us. And we'll be thankful. We have uh, 
a list of folks who are in need of prayer, and several of them we have been praying for for quite some time, and we want to continue holding them up. Julie Hungerford, who is recovering from back surgery, Hayden McLean, who is undergoing treatment for cancer, Floyd Polk, Floyd Polk who is also undergoing treatment for cancer, Nicole Kaiser, who's had a heart attack, Gene Smith, who has been struggling with a variety of physical ailments for quite some time. We also ask that uh, you look over, watch over our friends, Margaret Simpson and Mike Holliday, and Margaret Hughes, who's with us this morning. Um, we also ask for guidance for Becky Sago, who lost her mother not too long ago as she tries to organize her life. She needs guidance as well. I also, we're going to talk about it a little bit in our sermon today, but um, sometimes I watch a little more news and a little more TV than I ought to. I know I'm not alone in that indulgence, but all too often we are seeing our nation's leaders angry and accusatory and judgmental of each other, showing no love and tolerance, no ability to compromise, and it's distressing to see too much of that kind of thing. We also need to remember when we're seeing that, that in some ways they are a mirror of ourselves, that we also fall into those behaviors from time to time. And it's disturbing to me that our church, which is built on love and tolerance, sometimes gets caught up in the fervor and the anger involved in our political process. So I ask that we pray for our leaders. I ask that we pray that they may access God's wisdom. But I also ask that whether they do or not, that we, the Christian church, remember what we're about. Remember how our real needs are met so that we may exercise calm, we may exercise love and tolerance, and we may exercise wisdom as a church as an example to all of those around us. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your many blessings, and we know that even in the chaos of storms, natural occurrences, financial or economic upheaval, political chaos, sufferings from disease and, and other problems, that you're always at work, that you're always faithful, and that you're always finding ways to turn the events of this world to your will. We hold up all of those who've been mentioned in prayer. We also hold up all of those who have need of you, whether they've been mentioned or not. And that means all of us, because each of us has our weakness, each of us has our struggle, each of us needs access to your wisdom and your comfort. We are grateful for the change of seasons and the new newness that those changes bring. We ask that you watch over us in our daily lives and help us to remember that all of our actions should be based on how we see your will for our lives. We pray for all of these things in, your, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. 
It is our custom here at St. Stephen to recite the Apostles' Creed, and we do so every Sunday. I think I've done it every Sunday since I've been here except for one. But I have been taking classes as I am required to do, and the class that I'm currently involved in is one on the early Christian church. And we've been studying how the Nicene Creed came into being and, and what its purposes were. And I find it interesting that in today's church we worry about schisms and disagreements and churches splitting and who's right and who's wrong and how our theology should be handled. And it's comforting to know that that is not a new battle, that it's a battle that has followed us since the beginning of the church. And in the years following the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, many disagreements were had about the way to go about practicing Christian life and celebrating Jesus. And a group in the 200s and 300s started preaching that Jesus was created by God and that there was an order of importance and that God was first and that Jesus was second and that the Holy Spirit was third. And that may not sound earth shattering to us today, but we cannot believe in the Trinity and believe in that order of primacy at the same time. So the Nicene Creed was developed to establish what we believe as Christians. So this morning I want to read the, the Nicene Creed. If you have a United Methodist hymnal, you'll find it on the page preceding the Apostles' Creed on page 880. I apologize that you may not be prepared for this and you may not be able to recite it with me, but please listen closely to the statement of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who was spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Our second hymn of praise today is um, Take My Life and Let It Be. This morning, our scripture comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. That's Matthew 22, 15 through 22. When the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said, so they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? Whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
So if you do a little searching in the scriptures, you will find instructions about paying taxes in several places in both the Old and New Testaments. So why were the agents of the Pharisees amazed at the answer that Jesus gave them? This is just one of at least three occasions when the priests and Pharisees attempted to trap Jesus by asking him loaded questions. Their hope was that he would say, don't pay your taxes, so that they could accuse him of insurrection. Or, just as good, if he said, pay the tax, they could discredit him with the people who objected to showing reverence to the emperor of Rome. In their minds, no matter what Jesus answered, they would be able to use it against him. But Jesus had already preached that showing deference to a person because of their position or their power or their wealth was not right. But they were hoping that maybe he would contradict himself and discredit himself with the people. Now, that day, taxation was an especially important issue in the lives of the Jews, just like as it seems to be an important issue in our lives. They had to pay a temple tax. That was the law. They had to support the maintenance of the temple itself in Jerusalem. The temple tax also paid for the livelihood of the priests and those who were entrusted with the keeping of the temple. So in addition to the temple tax, paying taxes to Rome, which was a harsh and strict occupying government, that they considered as an unwanted intruder in their lives, paying taxes to Rome was just harsh. And it, it stressed the resources of many of the Jewish people. But aside from being difficult, it angered the devout Jews that they were forced to give their hard-earned money to a government that supported pagan worship and all sorts of practices that they considered immoral and not in line with God's law. And when you hear it from that point of view, at first glance, that sounds like a good argument. Why would I give money to an organization that's in violation of my beliefs? The various emperors of Rome were self-proclaimed gods themselves. So there's no question that paying taxes to them seemed inappropriate. Surely paying tribute to Rome violated God's law in some way. However, those who were sent to question Jesus we're not really there to debate these problems. Their purpose had nothing to do with whether paying the tax was right or wrong. Their purpose was to trick Jesus into some form of blasphemy or heresy or some other statement that could be used against him. And they were amazed because they thought they had him cornered and Jesus gave an answer that couldn't be used against him. His answer chastised them by pointing out the basic tenets of their faith. They were supposed to be God's chosen people. Jesus never preached on politics because politics were not relevant to a people who were supposed to be di governed directly through their relationship with God. The Jewish Pentateuch, or Pentateuch, 
which constitutes the first five books of our Bible, describes the lives of the Jews governed not by a man, not by a man-made structure, but by God's law. Jesus' teaching was based on Scripture. Imagine that. Shocking. No matter whether a nation was ruled by a king or queen or emperor or a prime minister or a president or Congress, they ruled by God's lead. No matter whether they were moral or immoral, Jewish, Christian, Muslim or pagan, God used them to accomplish his will. As an example, when Israel was conquered by the Assyrians, or the Babylonians, or the Greeks, or the Romans, God used it. It suited his purpose in calling his children back to him. The emperor that caused the exile of the Jews to Babylon was a pagan. The king that released Israel and sent them home to rebuild their temple was a pagan. Both of them ruled by God's lead, and God used them to accomplish his will. Jesus wanted the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the people's, people themselves to see that Rome was not really their problem. Their problem was in their personal attitude toward God. Jesus didn't care about earthly wealth. Jesus knew that a proper dependence on God and living a life driven by love and justice was what really mattered. A person's true wealth was their faith, their love, and their willingness to serve God. So since taxes mean money, what did Jesus teach us about money? He didn't teach politics, but he did teach money. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And in Hebrews chapter 13, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And again from Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And then in Timothy, again, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is 
through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So Jesus knew that what mattered was not taxes or money or a coin with some emperor's face on it or earthly things of any kind. The priests and the Pharisees were supposed to guide Israel's spiritual lives, not their interactions with Rome. People who are focused on their personal relationship with God find love and contentment and comfort, no matter what laws of man govern their earthly lives. This whole topic brings into question the political activism that we see in many Christian leaders and Christian churches today. Does my opposition to abortion or prejudice or war or gambling or sexual and gender preference give me the right to demonstrate hate and intolerance toward those who feel different from me? Of course not. Does Jesus teach us not to obey the laws that we disagree with? Of course not. How many Christians are spending hours of their time ranting about how awful the president is or how horrible the Democrats are? I've been guilty of it. I'll admit it. Those same hours spent in anger and judgment and resentment could have been spent in prayer for our government or spreading the gospel or feeding the poor. Jesus said to give to God the things that are God's. What are those things that we should give to God? What does God want? Our prayers and our intimacy with him, our minds, our hearts, our time. I can go to work tomorrow and earn more money. How do I earn more time? What really matters to God? I can replace the money that I pay in taxes or give to charity. How do I replace the opportunity to help someone in need? How do I replace the opportunity to spread God's love once I've missed it or let it pass? I believe this about politics. We should use our minds and our prayers to decide how to vote. But once that vote is cast, our part is done. Trust God to be God. Trust that no matter who gets elected, God is in charge of all things. If you've watched any TV, you've probably heard at least one or two celebrities say, if so-and-so gets elected, I'm leaving the country. But they're still here. None of them have left. If that's the extent of their integrity, why are we listening to their opinions? Folks, I don't like paying taxes. I'll be honest with you. Don't like it at all. But I do like paved roads. I don't like paying taxes. But I do like knowing that there's a fire department to protect my home. Or knowing that there's a police department to 
to protect our lives and our children. I don't like paying taxes, but I do like having schools and universities. If Donald Trump is reelected, the next day I'll be cutting grass. If Joe Biden is elected, the next day I'll be cutting grass. I don't see my life changing a whole lot, regardless of how this election comes up. So why do I get so wrapped up in the emotions of this thing? Donald Trump is not my God. Joe Biden is not my God. And they don't determine how I live my life. You cannot serve God in money. You cannot serve God in popular opinion. You cannot serve God in hatred. Amen? Make me a servant. Thank you for being here or for viewing with us. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. <laughs>